You're he firing Bob Chapek? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been yet another bad week for the Disney company. Their fourth quarter report was dreadful. The stock crashed again. A popular financial analyst said that Chapek should be fired. And then Chapek said he was going to let a bunch of cast go. So it's not going very well this past week for the Disney company. And as much as Disney execs want to tell us that everything is going great, they look more like the gun show dog. But that's a conversation for another video. I'm not exactly the guy that knows what's best for the Disney company. With that said, let's talk about that bad week and what I think is best for the Disney company. <laughs> Last week, Disney announced the Q4 financial reports for the period ending October 1st, 2022. And like I said, while they did their best to make it sound like it was yet another great quarter, Disney's great, the company's going great, everything is great, uh, the numbers didn't bear that out. Now, not that I blame them. you, you got to be positive. I'm a positive guy, and I, I don't blame them for trying to put a positive spin on things, but it definitely was not a good quarter. It was a bad quarter. Some say the worst quarter that Disney has had in decades. That was a one horrible quarter. That may have been that was a quarter for the ages. So let's take a quick look at the numbers. I, I, it's going to be quick. I won't bore you guys too much. This is going to be a little bit dry, but hopefully it'll help you discern what happened this past quarter. Disney reported revenues of $20.1 billion for the fourth quarter. This is up $1.6 billion year over year from 2021, same quarter last year, which, by the way, should be the case factoring in inflation. Inflation for the past year was 7.7%, suggesting a break-even year over year would be just under $20 billion. What that means is, uh, since last year, inflation has risen. Prices of everything have risen. So therefore, if prices go up, Revenue goes up. If you factor that into the 2021 numbers, if they had sold the same exact amount of stuff <laughs> this year that they did last year, it would have been about $20 billion. Now, recall, though, that there was no Genie Plus or Lightning Lane this time last year. However, last quarter, Q3 ending July 2nd, Disney reported $21.5 billion in revenue. So this quarter, we're down from that number, $1.35 billion. Disney made $1.35 billion less than they did last quarter. Why? Now, mind you, this isn't a loss. They didn't lose $1.35 billion. They just missed their expectations by $1.35 billion. Disney actually still made a profit last quarter of $1.6 billion. But that's the issue, the miss. Financial analysts, shareholders, Disney themselves, they predicted they would earn $21.43 billion in, the, in, the pre, in Q4, and they missed. Now, by itself, that's actually not a very big story. Uh, companies miss their targets often. It happens a lot. Now, it doesn't exactly positively affect their stock price, but it does happen a lot and they recover and everything is fine. The real problem is EPS, earnings per share. And that is simply put, the company's net profit, how much they earn, the net income, not the revenue, but how much they earned in profit, divided by the total number of shares outstanding. Before the quarter started, it was projected that Disney would have an EPS of 56 cents per share. However, they reported 30 cents per share. That's a miss of nearly 50%. In other words, they were way off. They, they weren't even close. And that's what scared investors. That's what triggered Jim Cramer to suggest that Disney CEO Bob Chapek should be fired. He's got to be fired. Uh, that, that's pretty cut and dry. You're he firing Bob Chapek? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the quarter itself, the way he handled it? I mean, he made it sound like it was just a four-star quarter. I, I, he, delusional. Disney, as a publicly traded company, has been trending, has been on a downhill slide for, for a while now, more than a year. It wasn't that long ago that they were trading north of $190 per share. I remember when everybody was like, hey, do you think Disney might get under 100 It got as low as $87 before it ticked up again. Do you think that sure. it's Chapek the man, or do you think it is... The, I think the he cyclical and it. secular headwinds no, that are no, facing no, this. No, no, what, you think he has like a bad team? He has the same team. What happened here is that even the, the stuff that he was good at, the stuff that I, that I know it's a little harder to control theme park, but the, the losses here, Andrew, were, were just mind-boggling. I mean, when you're going over the quarter, you, it's stunning. This is a very astute observation by Jim Cramer. The host is trying to suggest that maybe, maybe there's some other reason besides Chapex management that is led to Disney's poor performance. But the reality is, is that Disney, I mean, if you're going to use a sports analogy, Disney has had the same team uh, for years. In fact, Disney has been competing against, when we're talking about 
year-over-year numbers financially, like in the quarter reports, they've had the luxury this past year or so of competing against quarters where Disney wasn't running at full strength, where they actually didn't have the same team because of COVID. They, the parks weren't open. People weren't going to the movies. People were streaming more, and that's where they were able to elevate the stock because Disney was heavily invested in D Disney+. Plus. People saw that as, as a great sign for the Disney company. But setting aside the COVID situation, uh, if everything is going great, if the parks are great, which they still are, never mind the fact that you know, there are things that we complain about, maintenance and you know, the price of things and the reservation system, parks are still going well, though. If the parks are great, the movies are going great, and Disney Plus is great, but the Disney company isn't performing well, then it, it's got to be coaching, right? And by the way, it should be noted that he's been in charge for a few years now. He's actually got his coaching staff. <laughs> I'm going to continue this analogy. He's got his own coaching staff in there. He's been able to bring in his own people. He's elevated his people. He has let go some very high-level executives. He's let go. We, that's all been very public. Uh, so he, he's got his own team. It would be one thing if, if he had done that and everything had elevated after that. And we said, okay, Chapik, you know, you, you were right. Those guys, should, but things have not gotten better. Things are getting worse after all of that. Now, in fairness, it could be said that Chapik was handed a very bad hand when he first came on board. He, he could, you could say he, he started with two strikes or he started on, on second down or third down even. If we're going to... <laughs> beat the sports analogy to death. He, he didn't start out ahead. He, he, didn't, he didn't get a head start. He was handed a, a, a crippling amount of debt due to the Fox purchase. I, I think they wound up paying $70 million for Fox, plus another, I don't know, 20, $25 million for Hulu. So those two purchases alone, <sighs> per my friend Chris, that's a metric ton of debt. A, oh, nearly $100 billion. <laughs> A hundred billion in debt that they've got to find out how to figure out how to service that debt. No small feat for any company to deal with, especially a company that, uh, when Chapek first came on board, was about to go through COVID. Everything gets shut down, so they've got no money coming in. I mean, it's a tough, tough start, a tough way to go, which is why Chapek was given so much leeway, I think, because he is a numbers guy. He's, a, he's able to figure out ways to, to find money to pay for things and keep things afloat, and they did. Actually, the stock... Once there was the big drop after COVID, the stock skyrocketed. That's when it hit the near 200. Now, having said all of that, which I'm fond of saying, that's, that's old news. That, that stuff has been around for years. The debt has been around for years. They are, they're well aware of the debt. This is not new re revelatory information. It was not a big surprise. It's not a big surprise on the books in the Q4 financial reports. It's baked in. In other words, the EPS, the earnings per share, should have already factored that in. And they did, to be sure. Disney factored that in into their 56 cents per share estimate. But they still missed and buy a lot. And that's why people believe that this can only be mismanagement or a misunderstanding of your, your, your business or your customer. So the day after Disney's, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, fifth downward spike in a year, an internal memo gets leaked that Disney is going to be doing some major cost cutting. They're going to establish a cost structure task force that will include Christine McCarthy, she's the CFO, General Counsel Horatio Gutierrez, and led, of course, by Bob Chapek. Hiring will be frozen, jobs will be cut, efficiencies sought out. By the way, stock went up after this announcement. <laughs> it went up by like five bucks. Now, I will say here, I don't think, because this is a Disneyland-specific channel conversation, I don't think these cuts are going to affect frontline cast members. Uh, I, I feel like they still don't have enough, and they, and they know that. They're st they've been in a hiring craze for a while now. So while there is going to be a hiring freeze corporate-wide, I don't think that includes Disneyland or the parks in general. More likely, I think it'll be jobs related to Disney+, Plus, which is where most of the expenses appear to be occurring, uh, you know, the recent increase in expenses. They, they, sp they spent... $30 billion on content last year for Disney+, Plus, and they're planning to spend another $30 billion on content next year for Genie, or for Genie Plus, for Disney+. Plus. All while, well, this is part of the reason why, the streaming service is still not profitable. So, I mean, in a sense, it makes a lot of sense. But again, I mean, when, I, when I say that, I mean that, that, they shouldn't be, that they shouldn't be making as much money as it appears that they should be. They're earning $20 billion, they're spending $19 Think about that. 
Think about that. Think about all that revenue that they're earning and they're spending almost all of it. I mean, that's what Walt would have done. So, uh, but again, that, that, that's, that's known, it's baked in, and they still miss. It makes me kind of, this, the Disney Plus thing, actually, let's get on a little tangent. I, that's a bold move. The, the, the way that, that Disney has gone after Disney Plus has made it sort of their do or die situation. They hung everything on Disney Plus during COVID. Uh, but if you're going to go all in like that, man, that requires a constant supply of new content. Streaming viewers will unsub faster than Chapik can say Synergy Machine, which is something that he actually did say in the memo. T- <laughs> in the memo, speaking of things that Chapik has said or that executives said in the past, in the memo, he's, he's, he talks about a Synergy Machine. I mean, that's just another... Who are, okay, I don't want to get into that. They will, they will unsub super fast if you don't provide a lot of content. So they're, they're going to have to find, man, that is just, that is just, that's a commitment. I, I hope that they can manage to find that much new content quarter after quarter, year after year on Disney+. Plus. That's going to be a tough sled. So costs are getting cut, uh, mostly short-term gains. Will this work? Is this a solution to what is ailing uh, Disney? I, I don't think so, no. And it's, it's because what's ailing Disney has nothing to do with revenue and income and expenses and profit. I mean, we've all seen it. Disney has been hell-bent on trying to create revenue where none existed before, i.e. Genie Plus uh, and Lightning Lane. And the hope, of course, is to capitalize on, on pent-up demand, that people are have, which we're still talking about two years after the parks have reopened, but they're still talking about that. And certainly, uh, you know, those, you know, Genie Plus and Lightning Lane and then rising costs up beyond the rate of inflation. So if rate of inflation is 7.7%, Disney has been raising prices 9, 10, or 11%. So they're, 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 they're padding that. They're not just keeping up with inflation. They're going beyond that. They're outpacing inflation. That has certainly created more revenue, uh, good for Disney, but at what cost, I wonder? Looking back at Q4 2021, where revenue was at $18.5 billion, since they began selling Genie Plus and Lightning Lane and have had major price increases across the board, as mentioned, Last year, they did $18.5 billion. That would have been $19.9 billion today if you factor in that 7.7 rate of inflation. After all that, they added just another $250 million. Now, that seems like a lot, but it's really not when you compare it within the context of $20 billion. Uh, it's not a big deal. And I, you know, when Genie Plus was first announced, I said, you can't just stack costs, expenses on guests. We're already paying for tickets. We're already paying for merchandise. We're already paying for food, right? Now you want to add another $25 layer, $50 layer perhaps per person? Okay, uh, yeah, well, well, some of us are going to pay for, for Genie Plus, but we're going to do that, but we're not going to buy some merchandise, or maybe we're not going to buy as much food, right? Or maybe we're not going to go to the park as often. In other words, guests are budgeting, okay? So they're, they're doing their job. The guests are doing their job to, to combat this inflation and extra costs. You know, it's interesting because that was... <laughs> This is something that we've noticed for a long time, too, where JPEG has talked about in these quarter reports often, where he's talking about a per-guest spend. That was one of their favorite measurables, was per-guest spend, and how great it was at Walt Disney World, not so great at Disneyland. And everybody said, gosh, Bob, that's the reason for that is that the guests are different at Walt Disney World. They don't come every weekend like they do at Disneyland. <laughs> the guests are different. The per-guest spend is supposed to be different at Disneyland. Well, they kind of got what they wanted in that sense. They got a higher guest per spend. They're just not going as often now. So there's, you know, the net gain isn't happening. Now, some might say, hey, that's great. That's great. That means the fewer people in the parks. I don't mind if, if the APs don't come as often as they could. I don't mind that the reservation system is keeping APs out of the parks because it makes the parks less crowded. So good job, Disney. Uh, it seems to be working. It's a byproduct. It's an effective byproduct of your plans. Uh, but I've often said, again, uh, that, that Disney's... Disney's, how they treat capacity it has nothing to do with uh, pricing. They, they just, can, they, they control it by let how many people they're going to let into the park that day. At any time they want, they could just let in more people. Just ask Disney CFO Christine McCarthy. She was asked during the earnings call if Disney had any contingency plans for a possible recession in 2023. One of the things she mentioned was a possible discounted ticket. Not quite to the extent that they've done in the past, but they, they, they might discount tickets or... She also teased 
the idea that they could bring back the annual passes. In other words, they are more than willing to sell annual passes again anytime where the situation requires it, when they need the money, if they're, not, if they're, if they're faced with a, a financial situation such as a recession. And by the way, this <laughs> right here, okay, this is where I need to edit, or this is where I have had to edit this video. We've already put a video yesterday, annual passes are back. And in that video, I talked about how I had already written this script that we're filming at this moment, and that I had to edit that script to account for that. Because that's exactly what they did. They did bring back annual passes. But they didn't wait for a recession. The bad news has already hit. APs are out again. Let's resume our regularly scheduled news update on this topic. Canceling the Magic Key program was, was not an act of altruism by the Disney company. They didn't do it in order to make the world a better place for the family from Colorado or Seattle. It's a button they're more than willing to press anytime they need to. And in a case of emergency, break glass, hit annual pass button. It's, it's just simply too lucrative not to. They're never going to leave money on the table for that long. And I, I hope that Disneyland guess what well, park goers around the world, I hope they understand, I hope they're prepared to bear the brunt of, of covering for the, the losses that Disney has been incurring uh, the past couple of quarters. Because of all the revenue streams that Disney has, parks has been the most reliable. Actually, let's take another quick look. I'll make it, I'll make it quick, I promise. Uh, as some figures from the quota reports. You recall that Disney reported $21.8 billion in Q1. That's Christmas season. $20.2 billion in Q2. And then up again to $21.5 billion in Q3. Very good quarter. And then most recently down unexpectedly to $20.1 billion in Q4. That compares worse than the January Q1, which is a very poor quarter for Disney traditionally, especially parks. But if we look at just parks, Q1, 7.2 billion. Again, that's the Christmas season. 6.6 billion in Q2, should be down. Then back up again, 7.3 billion in Q3, outstanding quarter. You can see that it compares favorably. They beat the Christmas season. And then up again to 7.4 billion in Q4, where the Disney company as a whole, the entire Disney company was down a lot in Q4. Parks went up. What this means is that we are a reliable consumer. We, we, we show up. And it also means, that, <laughs> unfortunately, that uh, we are now a prime candidate for some of those budget cuts. I'm not talking about staffing, cast, I think we're going to be fine. But we, I, should, I would expect budget cuts to happen at Disney parks because the idea being they can cut, 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 and we're, they, but they know we're still going to show up. And they have reason to believe that, and that's because we have shown up. And I have to say, I mean, a, a friend of mine suggested that Disney consumers are the kind of guests that takes a long time for them to uh, burn out, I guess. They stick around longer. They give more grace than maybe some others would in a different industry or whatever. But that's because the product is so good. And it, it's just so, it's so good. Disneyland is so, Disney Parks is so good. We feel so good when we go there. The, the product is outstanding. The fun is so real and so genuine that it's hard to say no. And I, I have to say, I have to admit that in, having said all of this, I'm still going to go. <laughs> like I said in the past, man, I may not agree with everything the Disney company does. I, I, may, I may like see through some of their, their moves, some of their decisions. Uh, they're not exactly, I mean, they think that they're fooling everybody, but they're pretty transparent. We're, Disney fans, Disneyland fans, are far more intelligent and, and observant than I think they give us credit for. But anyway, I know I, I, I feel like I'm supposed to be you know, out there advocating to, to, you know, for consumer rights and stuff like that, but I just can't help it, man. Uh, I love Disneyland. <laughs> and I think a lot of you do too. That's why I know people are watching this. Like, man, this is just a terrible, terrible story. Uh, and it's not going well. But hey, look, understand that in spite of all this, this is not a, this is not a very positive message that, that is happening right now with the Disney company. They're not going anywhere. It's not, they're, they're, Disney's not going, they're going to figure it out. Be that with Chapik or some other management team or whatever. How long it's going to take for them to figure it out, I don't know, but they will figure it out. They w there will come a point when they're going to decide that they have, they have done too much damage uh, that, you know, the, the parks are in bad shape, you know, that they're, they're going to start putting money back in the parks. They're going to start putting money back into maintenance. They're going to start putting money back on the cast. They're going to start putting money back towards the AP program. 
They're going to start putting money into uh, new attractions, new lands, park expansions. Who knows? It will happen. It, there will come a time. So with that, I, I, I felt like I just ended the conversation, but I do want to say one more thing. I will add that, and there's no, t there's no way of telling if this is going to be a correct statement or not, but I do believe, I think, that if Disney had just been patient, if they had just stayed the course, if they had changed nothing, they would be in a better position as a company. Both Disney as a whole and Disney Parks would be in a better position, not just in the quality of the product and, and, and everything else, but also financially. I feel like their, their financial books would be better today if they had just stayed the course. Same annual pass program, same max pass, say all that, you know, 2019 basically all over again. I, I feel like that was the ideal situation. And they could still do it today. I don't think that they will, but they still could. You know, uh, as I said in yesterday's video though, the fact that they were willing to change their mind on a dime with the annual pass program, instead of having a measured approach to it, which it felt like it was going to be measured for a long time, but then all of a sudden, like that, they just changed their mind, suggests that it's possible they could change their mind on some other stuff too, namely the reservation system. Uh, so, you know, there's hope. Good news is, is we get to go to Disneyland tomorrow. I get to go to Disneyland tomorrow. I haven't been in a few days. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to go to Disneyland and have a whole bunch of fun. I'm going to shoot a bunch of video and share it with you guys. I hope you guys can enjoy. Uh, until then, follow us on Instagram at underscore fresh baked. On Twitter at Fresh Baked Disney, that's Fresh with no E. And on TikTok at Fresh Baked Disney. And if you like our show and want to show your support, please do consider joining our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash freshbaked. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, everybody. We love you. Be safe out there. Be kind to one another. Fresh Baked. I just realized. We're gonna do that thing again. I just realized that there was a whole part in here that I didn't I didn't cover. I want to talk about Chapik. I've said before that Chapik is I, I, no doubt about it. That man is very intelligent. Absolutely, absolutely an intelligent person. He's got a mind that uh, is pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting mind, and uh, I you know I, I have a feeling he could be very effective in other areas. I don't, people talk about legacies, CEO legacies of, of you know, of, of Disney CEOs and what they want, you know, how they're remembered or how they wanted to be remembered. Some are remembered for uh, park expansions, um, Disneyland Paris, the hotels, all those hotels and the park expansions under the Eisner area. Eisner was remembered or, you know, he's the guy who realized that Disney could make money, you know, that the parks could make money. They weren't, they weren't selling far near enough for the tickets, that kind of thing. And then there was the, obviously the animation renaissance for Eisner. So he's got a lot to be proud of. Uh, Chapik, you know, uh, what? <laughs> Pixar, Star Wars, uh, or Lucasfilm, uh, uh, Marvel. Um, there's another one. Oh, Fox. Dude, how much did he spend on those things? So obviously that's... That's, uh, did I say Chapik? Iger. That's Iger's legacy. I don't think, I don't think that, I, that Chapik is concerned about that. I don't think he's concerned about how his legacy is viewed uh, in terms of being a Disney CEO. Uh, I think he's, he, and this is the reason why he's hung on so much, why he's, why he's really like dug in on some of these concepts. I, I, matter of fact, I don't think that the annual pass thing was his idea. I think he would have preferred not to bring back annual passes. I think somebody talked him into it. Uh, but this was something a friend of mine mentioned to me and you know, other people have talked about. He wants to be known or remembered as the guy who, who revolutionized finance in the sense of how, you know, the cracking the code on how to extract the most money you know, using the flex pricing and, you know, all these little, the stratas that he set up, uh, you know, the, the, and they're still going. Oh, my gosh, just, yes, what was it, two days ago? Walt Disney World, new price system. Now the, now the flex pricing is based on which park you're going to. Okay, so, you know, the, <laughs> they used to be all the same price, which, I mean, I guess to be fair, it shouldn't be. Just like here, I can't believe they charge the same price here at DCA for Disneyland. I mean, what? But then again, 
How many folks are buying a ticket just for DCA? Is that a thing? You're either going to Disneyland or getting a park hopper, I feel like. Is there... I know that there are annual pass holders who don't mind just going to DCA and then calling it a day. But are there single-day ticket holders out there who are paying full price for DCA and not going to Disneyland? I guess there are. Let's say you buy a three or four day, uh, three or four day ticket. I guess you spend one of those. Anyway, uh, yeah. So I think I feel like Chapik wants to go down in history as the guy who revolutionized how people, how companies charge for their product. Can you imagine, for example, Starbucks having flex pricing? <laughs> like Starbucks pretty much invented mobile order, right? Well, they were the first. I think I don't know if they invented it, but I, I felt as as memory serves, they were the first to to do the mobile order thing, and it went really well. Uh, it's still going well. And now all the other companies are, you know, getting into it, which is still not the same. More people, I think, mobile order at Starbucks than they do, let's say, you know, fast food joint or something like that. But imagine selling coffee. When do you want your coffee? I like my coffee in the morning and in the evening, okay? So that's when I buy most of my coffee if I'm going to Starbucks. In the morning and the evening, I don't buy a lot of Starbucks at 2 in the afternoon. Imagine if Starbucks had flex pricing just like an airline, or just like Disney's trying to do. And I feel like he, he, that, that's what his thing is. He doesn't care. I don't think he cares uh, how he's remembered as a Disney CEO, to be honest, unless that, you know, that victory comes with you know, him resuscitating the company. How well that's going for him right now, it's, that's not going particularly well for him. But I do feel like, I do feel like that if JPEG were somehow, for some reason, uh, removed from CEO at Disney, he would land on his feet, and uh, we would see we would see him apply some of these same concepts into another company, and maybe it would be a better fit. But the fact that Disney is a a, a company that is first built around creativity, you know, and in a relationship with its with its fans, I I I don't know if I just don't know if it, it's working. But you know, I don't know. It's it's just a conversation. It's just a conversation. I say all these things because the world is not black and white. You know, a lot of people just want to say, ah, fire Chapik. And everybody's like, no, Tiger. And, you know, or Disneyland sucks. I'm never going back again. And, you know, or, you know, you got to, you got to vote with your wallet. No, man. I just, I don't see things like that, I guess. I, uh, it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray area and there's a lot of, you know, you can't just, there's nothing you could say to me today that would, even in spite of, you know, me not being a biggest fan of Chapik. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe he did save the company. <laughs> who knows what would have happened if they had somebody else in charge during COVID and years after? Who knows? Maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, food for thought, Fresh Baked. I'll see you around. Fresh Baked. Bye, Fresh Baked. <laughs>